Right, good evening, ladies and gents. Welcome to lecture two of Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring course. My name is Tom Mogorossi. This evening, I'll be taking you through laws six, seven, and eight. And my co presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, will take us through laws nine, 10, and 11. We will have another question and answer session after the presentations are done. And our poster boy for the course, Langton Rosere, international umpire from Zimbabwe, uh, will again be joining us for what should be another interactive question and answer session. While Abdullah and I present, we request you all to put your microphones on mute and your cameras off. They should have been automatically deactivated, but it looks like that's not the case. So please, to avoid disturbances during the presentation, please put your microphone on mute and your cameras off until we get to the question and answer sessions. While we are presenting, you are welcome to type your question into the chat box. And please let us keep those questions specific to the content that is being presented. But the questions directed at Langton uh, can be anything about umpiring. When the question and answer session starts, you will raise your virtual hand, turn on your microphone and camera if you wish to do so when prompted to ask your question. We might go over time during the question and answer session. On Tuesday, we went an hour and a half over time, but it was such a great and interactive session that I am sure you will all be looking forward to a repeat this evening. If you don't get to ask your question, post it into the chat box before leaving, and you can watch the recording which will be posted on our YouTube channel after the lecture. Abdullah, if I can ask you to please go into the meeting room and um, mute all the other candidates to avoid disturbances during the presentation. So let's get on to the first law of today, which as I mentioned is law six, and that is the pitch. That is the area that the match is played on, that the bowler bowls to the batters, and this is where all the action happens. What shape is a pitch? The pitch is a rectangular area on the field of play, which is measured 20.12 meters in length, from the bowling crease to the bowling crease. We measure it specifically from the middle stump to the other middle stump. And a lot of people ask and wonder what happens if a pitch is too short or too long? What do we as umpires do? Well, it's pretty um, difficult to change the pitch or the markings of the pitch, especially if you arrive at a field and you find that the field has been prepared the day before and so there is no ground staff to assist you in trying to adjust incorrect pitch markings. What you need to do is you need to measure the pitch, so always have a tape measure up to 30 meters long to measure from middle stump to middle stump. And we have got an, a guideline here at Western Province Cricket Umpires Association that if a pitch is either more than 30 centimeters too long or more than 30 centimeters too short, then we will have to make a plan to change the 
pitch markings so that the one crease is brought closer or taken further away from the other crease so that we can get to 20.12 meters from middle stump to middle stump. If we are less than 30 centimeters out, whether too long or too short, we will make the captains aware of this, but we will not change the pitch markings. Why? Because as mentioned, it's very difficult, sometimes impossible, depending on the resources that you have or don't have, to change the pitch markings. So if it is less than 30 centimeters out, then we will leave the pitch markings and the crease markings as they are. We will just inform both captains that we are playing on a pitch that's either too long or too short by less than 30 centimeters. 30 centimeters sounds quite significant. It's about a foot. But if you take 30 centimeters divided by 20.12 meters, it is less than 1% variance of 20.12 meters. So compared to the entire length of the pitch, 30 centimeters is not too dramatic to be out by. Just be careful in the exam. The width of the of the pitch is 3.05 meters. But as you see on the left of this picture, there's a measurement from the middle stump each way, which is 1.52 meters. Be careful when answering questions about lengths of creases and the width of the pitch. Have a look at the arrows and make sure that you are answering what measurement they are looking for. Are they looking for on the right hand side? the full width of the pitch, which is 3.05 meters, or are they asking for from middle stump to the one end of the pitch, which is 1.52 meters? Okay, so have a close look at those arrows before answering your questions in the exam. Who selects and prepares the pitch? And please, ladies and gentlemen, I ask all of you to mute your microphones to avoid disturbances for the presenters as well as the other candidates online this evening. Before the match, the ground authority shall be responsible for the selection and preparation of the pitch. During the match, the umpire shall take control of its use and maintenance. And this handover of the field is usually done at the toss. And we will learn later in the laws that the field is handed over by the ground staff to the umpires at the toss and the toss generally takes place between 30 minutes before the scheduled start of play or rescheduled start of play and latest 15 minutes before the start of play or rescheduled start of play. Can we change a match pitch? Let's see what the law says. The law says that the pitch shall not be changed during the match unless the umpires decide that it is dangerous or unreasonable for play to continue on it. And then only with the consent of both captains can the pitch be changed. OK, so it's not only a decision for the umpires to make. It is a decision for the umpires and both captains to decide whether or not they are willing and able to change the pitch. OK, this is after you have uh, started a match and you realize as umpires that it's dangerous or unreasonable for play to continue on this pitch because of uh, usually invariable and steep bounds that could be hurting batters 
with balls jumping off a full length into a batter's helmet. Junior cricket, do we use the same length of pitch as we do for senior cricket? Let's see what the law says. The law says that the governing body for cricket in the country concerned shall determine the length of the pitch for junior cricket. So there is no set measurement that junior cricket needs to be played on pitches of the specific length. The law allows the governing body for cricket in that particular country to decide whether or not junior cricket shall be played on full length pitches, 20.12 meters or made shorter. And if they are to be made shorter, there is no measurement specified by the law. So that is the pitch. And now we move on to the creases. And I did make reference to crease markings earlier. We shall now look into them in detail. So there's a picture of what used to be called Senwes Park in Potchefstroom. It's now known as the JB Marks Oval. And that is what a crease looks like for a limited overs match. We have got uh, three creases. I will name them for you before we go into that detail. Uh, you have the return creases on either side. Uh, then the crease closest to us going across the picture is called the popping crease. And as mentioned, when we measure the length of the pitch, we measure from middle stump to middle stump and the line that the stumps cut in half is the bowling crease. OK, so in summary, we've got the return creases on each side. Then we've got closest to us running across the screen, the popping crease and the stumps are pitched along the bowling crease. I've given you the names of those three creases. Let us have a look at the measurements for these creases. And there is no lime green text on this picture, but I can tell you now that there are 10 marks in the Cricket South Africa level one exam for the names of the creases and also the measurements of the creases. You don't have to memorize all of these um, names and measurements. Why? Because the exam is true or false questions as well as multiple choice questions. So you will see the option of return crease and bowling crease and pop increase in a multiple choice question. You just need to remember which one is the pop increase, which one is the return crease, and which one is the bowling crease. You will see all of these measurements that are here. Uh, you just need to remember which measurement is 1.22 meters. And that's the one that I will start with. It's the easiest for me to remember. It is what I call the noble measurement because the distance between the bowling crease and the popping crease, you will know or we will learn later in the laws that a bowler's front foot must land with some part of his or her front foot behind the popping crease. And when we say behind the pop increase, we mean the back edge of the pop increase. That's why you see the arrows go from back edge of the bowling crease to the back edge of the pop increase. That measurement is 1.22 meters. And then if you double that measurement and you get 2.44 meters, you will remember the length 
of the return creases. And quite important, it is a minimum length. OK, so that. Line. That extends from the pop increase past the bowl increase can go. All the way down to the boundary. It typically doesn't, but the law says that is a minimum measurement that should be painted. 2.44 meters. Of both return creases. You can paint it longer than 2.44 meters, but not less than 2.44 meters. If you take 1.22 meters. Our no ball measurement that we remembered and you multiply that by three, what do you get? You get 3.66 meters. And that right in the middle of the screen is the minimum length of the pop increase. If you look at the picture of the JB Marks oval pop increase, you will see that the line actually goes off the picture. This is because if you have a televised game and many years ago we used to have runners and runners run as far wide as where the strikers and umpire stands at square leg you need to have those lines extending further than the minimum 3.66 meters so that umpires are able to judge runouts and stumpings easily so coming back to our three creases let's revise the names as well as the measurements our return creases are on the sides and are a minimum length of 2.44 meters. Our pop increase is 3.66 meters, also a minimum length of 3.66 meters. And the distance between the Bowl increase and the pop increase, which I call the no ball measurement, is 1.22 meters. The last measurement is the width of the bowl increase, which essentially is the inside edge of the one return crease to the inside edge of the other return crease. It's on the far left of this picture. It is 2.64 meters. OK, and again, please be careful in the exam. Look at the arrows. They could be pointing from the inside edge of the one return crease until the middle stump. So that would be half the width of the bowling crease. 2.64 divided by 2 is 1.3. 32 meters. Don't go quickly through these questions in the exam. Take your time. Have a look at the arrows. If they ask for half the length or half the width of a crease, give them half the width or the length of the crease that they're asking for, not the full length. OK. Finally, on this diagram right at the bottom, reminder, very important, it's in the exam, the length of the pitch from one bowling crease to the other or from one middle stump to the other, 20.12 meters. Lastly, I will take you through law eight before Abdullah takes us through law nine, 10 and 11. Law eight is the wickets. What do the wickets look like? We have got three stumps and two bales on top of the three stumps, and together collectively they are called the wickets. What is the length of a stump? The stump from above ground 
because the bottom bit of each stump goes into the ground. Above ground, the stumps measure 71.12 centimeters. You can remember the measurements in inches if you want, because in the exam, both centimeters and inches measurements are given. However, practically in South Africa, we only have measuring tapes with centimeters, or we mostly have measuring tapes with centimeters. So I would encourage you to learn the meters and centimeter measurements of the pitch, the creases and the wickets and bales. When pitched properly, the width of the wickets from the outside of the off stump to the outside of the leg stump should be 22.86 centimeters. Another way to make sure that your stumps are pitched correctly and that they're not too wide of each other or not too narrow, the bales should sit comfortably in the grooves of the stumps as you see in this diagram. And also you can take a cricket ball and make sure that it does not fit through the gap between the middle stump and any of the other two stumps, either of the other two stumps. So a cricket ball should not go through, go between uh, any two stumps. If it does go through, then you know that the stumps have not been pitched correctly. We saw it many, many years ago, Pat Simcox, South African um, cricketer, was batting against Pakistan, and it was a spinner bowling, and the spinner bowled Pat Simcox. I think it was between the middle and the off stump, but the ball went straight through the stumps, did not dislodge either of the two bales, and Pat Simcox, according to the laws, survived, was not out bowled, and carried on batting. Um, very embarrassing for the umpires because they need to check that the stumps are pitched correctly and that a ball cannot go through between two stumps. Let's have a quick look at the bales. As mentioned, they sit on top of the stumps and shall not project more than 1.27 centimeters above the stumps. Uh, now in luminous or lime green, so the bale measurements are not examined in the level one exam, just for your knowledge. As mentioned earlier, the bales shall fit between the stumps without forcing them out of the stumps vertical positions. I'm sure those of you who watch test match cricket, have been watching test match cricket for many years, will remember that Mark Boucher, former South African wicket keeper, had to retire from cricket after when playing in a warm up match in England before a test match series, a ball bowled a batter and the bale flew off the top of the stumps. Mark Boucher was standing up to the stumps because a bowler, a spin bowler was bowling. And as the ball hit the stumps, the bale flew up into Mark Boucher's eye and he was badly injured, had to leave for surgery, and it turned out to be the last cricket match that he ever played. So after that incident, devices were brought in 
aimed at protecting player safety by limiting the distance that a bell can travel off the stumps. So what I have seen uh, in pictures, but not uh, physically in real life myself, is a string connecting the bell to the top of the stumps so that the bell cannot go further than say 15 centimeters from the top of the stump. Is this allowed? Yes, subject to the approval of the governing body for that match and also the ground authority. When do we dispense with bells? Here in Cape Town, we do experience heavy winds, especially during summer. And if bales are not heavy enough to stay on the top of the stumps and they keep coming off repeatedly, we then go ahead and take the bales off. And law tells us that the umpires may agree to dispense with the use of bales if we agree to do so, then no bells shall be used at either end. So you typically have a problem at one end, one set of stumps, their bells keep dropping off. But law tells us that if we take the bells off because they keep falling off at one end, we need to take both sets of bells off both sets of stumps. Quite importantly, the use of bells shall be resumed as soon as conditions permit. So as soon as that wind dies down, then please put the bales back on because it is more difficult for decisions, some decisions to be made when the bales are off. And we will handle those decisions later in the course when we get to the law about the wicket is put down. Okay, that's my lot for this evening, short and sharp. I will now hand over to Abdullah to take us through laws 9, 10 and 11, and after which we will go into our question and answers session. Good evening, Abdullah. Over to you, please. Good evening to you, Tom, and good evening to the rest of the attendees. Uh, thank you so much. I'm kicking off this evening with law number nine, which is the preparation and the maintenance of the playing area after the game has started. Uh, again, we are covering the laws of cricket. And we are co covering in these laws uh, more day cricket, uh, like test matches, which spans over five days. Uh, provincial cricket in South Africa spans over four days. But these are games where there are uh, more than one innings in a match. So law nine covers, after the game has started, how do you prepare the field and how do you maintain the playing area. Firstly, mowing of the pitch and the outfield. The law guide us by telling us that both pitch and the outfield needs to be mown on each day that the match is going to take place, whether permitting. So if I can use test matches as an example, which spans over five days, once the game has started, the, the law tell us that on each subsequent day, on day two, day three, day four, and day five, both the pits and the outfield needs to be mown. Reason for this is we need to try to keep the conditions the same over the five days. You'll be surprised how quickly grass grow overnight. I've actually seen it with my own eyes. I've been uh, third umpire for many provincial games. The um, on the uh, evening of day one, the uh, the covers will be put on, 
They will be removed early on day two. You'll be surprised overnight under those covers how quickly the grass grow. So importantly, pitch and outfield needs to be mown on each subsequent uh, day. So now we know pitch and outfield needs to be mown. What are the timings of these mowing? When it comes to the mowing of the pitch, law tell us that it needs to be completed not later than 50 minutes before the game is about to start. If I can use an example, in our test match, which starts at, say, 10 o'clock, by 9.30, the mowing of the pitch needs to be completed. Again, it's, highl it's highlighted in, in green, so there is a question in the exam on this. So mowing of the pitch needs to be completed not later than 30 minutes before play is about to start. What about the outfield? Mowing of the outfield needs to be done 15 minutes before play is about to start. So play starts at 10.45. Mowing of the outfield needs to be completed by 9.45. So now we've covered the pitch, the outfield, when they can be mowed. Next point is clearing of debris from the pitch. What is this debris? Debris is those uh, small stones, pebbles that uh, on, a, on a turf wicket that comes loose while the batters are running, bowlers are bowling, and they get sprayed all over the pitch. The law allows for these debris uh, or small little stones or pebbles to be cleared from the pitch. Let's see when the, when the debris can be cleared. Firstly, law tells us that before the start of each day's play, after the completion of mowing and before rolling, and it tells us the window period is not earlier than 30 minutes nor later than 10 minutes before play is about to start. So firstly, you're allowed to clear the debris before the start of each day's play. You're also allowed to clear these small pebble stones between innings. And it needs to happen before rolling is going to take place. You're also allowed to clear the debris at all intervals for meals, like your lunch interval and your tea interval. How do you clear the debris from the pits? Law tell us two ways. Firstly, by sweeping, by using a broom to remove the debris from the pits. The second uh, method is if the umpires consider that if you are going to use a, a broom, it might cause detrimental damage to the surface of the pits. If that is the case, you can clear the debris by using your hand. So not, not you as the umpire, but the ground staff, they will either use a broom, but if the, uh, if the pits, um, uh, if they feel that the pits is a bit brittle and if using a broom, it might cause uh, damage to the pits, they are allowed to use their hand to clear the debris from the pits. Rolling of the pits. So now, this is now after the game has started. Before the game has started, the ground staff can roll to their heart's content. They can roll the pitch as long as they want, as much as they, as they want, while they're preparing the pitch for the game. This is now before the game has started. But once the game has started, the law tells us that you can only roll the pits two instances. Firstly, before the start of each innings, other than the first innings of the game, and then secondly, before the start of each subsequent day's play. So just to confirm again, before the start of each uh, innings, then you are allowed to roll, and before the start of each subsequent day's play. Example of these, South Africa, let's say South Africa wins the toss, they bat first in the test match. 
they get dismissed for 200. The opponents, India, will now go into bat. The, after getting dismissed, there will be a change of innings. Then while these, uh, the, the change of innings will be 10 minutes, the law allows for the pitch to be rolled during that change of innings. We will now also cover how long that pitch can be rolled. So that is before the start of each innings. And also before the start of each subsequent day's play. So on day two, day three, day four, day five, law tell us that the pitch should be rolled before the start of day two, day three, and day four. So now we know when the, the pitch can be rolled. How long can the pitch be rolled? All the law tell us is that it cannot be rolled for more than seven minutes. So if the captain asks you to roll for five minutes, will you allow that? Yes, you'll allow it. If you ask or you see ask for three minutes, will you allow it? Yes, you'll allow it. Because all the law tell us not more than seven uh, minutes. So practically uh, how this works, let's say in a test match, there are usually four umpires, two on field. There'll be a TV umpire and there will be a fourth umpire. So part of the duties of the fourth umpire is to supervise the, the rolling. So what usually happens when there's an innings change, the on-field umpires will ask the now batting captain, do they want rolling, yes or no? If the captain say, yes, I want rolling, they will then ask the captain, and usually at your international and provincial grounds, there are more than one roller available. Uh, you'll find a heavy roller, a medium roller, and a small hand roller. You'll then also ask the batting captain, so yes, you want rolling. Which roller do you want to use? There are three options available, heavy, medium, and the hand roller. And the captain will then choose, let's say, the medium roller. Then they will also ask the captain, do you want, how long do you want rolling? Captain will then inform you, let's say, five minutes. You'll allow then five minutes rolling, and the fourth umpire needs to supervise uh, the rolling. So in terms of the timings permitted for these rollings. So before play start, we've just heard that rolling to be done between innings and before the play, uh, the start of play on each subsequent day. There is a window period that the, this rolling needs to take play before the start of play on day two, day three, day four, and day five. So what is this window period? It's not more than 30 and not less, less than 10 minutes before play is about to start. So example, our test match starts at 10 o'clock. So the window period for rolling to take place is between 9.30 and the latest is 9.50. earlier than 9.30, and the latest that uh, rolling can take place is 9.50. Are you allowed to water the pitch after the game has started? No, you are not allowed to water the pitch at all after the game has started. Are you allowed to remark the creases after the game has started? Yes, the law allows for this by telling us creases can be remarked whenever either umpire consider it necessary. And at international and provincial level, it uh, usually happens during the intervals, uh, especially the popping crease. That's where the bowler's front foot lands most of, uh, of the time and where batters run. That Crease usually uh, the the white paint uh, usually disappear, so the law allows for creases. All of the creases doesn't just have to be the popping crease. All of the creases can be remarked, and the ground staff usually do it during intervals. Are you allowed to maintain footholds during the game? Uh, yes, you are. You'll often see in more day cricket bowlers landing on the same uh, spot over, ball after ball, over after over, and you'll find uh, holes appearing inside the, the popping crease. 
the law allows for those footholds to be maintained. The ground staff will return those footholds. It, it often happens um, at the end of the of the day where they will return the footholds. The law allows uh, for this. Also, the law allows bowlers needs to be secure of the footholds, especially the fast bowlers. They need to have confidence where they put the front foot uh, down, and umpires needs to allow uh, this. Sometimes when it uh, is a bit wet, uh, let's say it is the grass is a bit slippery, the law allows for sawdust to be thrown. Uh, where the bowler's front foot will land, just to secure the bowler's foothold, especially the fast bowlers, while while um, delivering the ball. Covering the pitch. Are we allowed to cover the pitch? Yes or no? Before the game, law tell us that the use of covers, sole responsibility of the ground authority. They will decide before the game when, how they're going to cover the pits. After the game has started, how do you now cover the pits? Law tell us, and there are some playing conditions uh, um, that is slightly different, but according to uh, the law, the law tell us that the pitch needs to be covered on each night of the match and in, during inclement weather. So if it's raining, the law allows the pitch to be, to be covered. After the day's play, the law allows the pitch to be covered. So in our test match, that spans over five days, at the end of day one, the ground staff will cover the pitch. End of day two, they'll cover the pitch. Similarly, day three and uh, the evening of day four, and if there's inclement weather around, the law allows for the pits to be covered. Law also allows the whole pits to be covered and a minimum of 1.22 meters beyond uh, each end. That is what the law say, how you need to cover the pits. The law also allow for the bowlers run-ups to be covered. So yes, the law speaks about the whole pits to, to be covered, bowlers run-ups to be covered, but you'll find at most international and provincial grounds, um, the whole square actually get covered. The square is, uh, and at most of these international and provincial grounds, the square consists of 10, 12, 14. I know at Newlands Cricket Ground in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, there, there's about 15, 16 pitches on the square. And when they cover, they don't just cover the match pits, the whole square gets covered at the end of the uh, of the day's uh, play, and also um, if it rains, they do cover the whole square. When it comes to the removal of covers, covers to be removed as soon as practicable on each day that play is expected to take place. And also during uh, inclement weather, so once it starts raining, you put the covers on, and once it stopped raining, you need to remove the covers. This is just an example of a uh, train bridge of the uh, test match ground train, train bridge in England. There are various covers that they use. Most grounds uh, use um, the um, uh, plastic seat to cover it, but in, but in certain grounds in England, they do use these type of covers. I'm going to play you a video now. This is again a train bridge in England where you'll see the ground staff bringing on the covers to cover the pits. Abdullah, can you share with sound, please? Uh, there doesn't seem to be sound on the video. Okay, uh, copy that, uh, Tom. Just give me a second. Initially, I did see it with sound, but I don't know why I didn't 
so Sean, but let's try again. <laughs> It's not sharing at the moment uh, anything, Abdullah. Copy that, Tom. Let's do it again. Let me include sound, sharing. Can you confirm that you're able to see my screen, Tom? And see your screen, yeah. Okay. And there is sound now. Thank this you. This is the scene at Trent okay. Bridge, Nottingham. Second day. Consulate scene as uh, this light drizzle that's been falling since the start of play has got a little heavier. We all hope that it won't last for very long. So, this is the uh, that's the county hall with a green roof, the headquarters of the Nottinghamshire County Council. And over there is the world-renowned, as it said on it, Trent Bridge Inn. So, it's Michael Parkinson saying cheerio for now. Thank you, Michael. And this is a picture of a ground in Sri Lanka. And here you see because of uh, the grounds in Sri Lanka doesn't have good drainage, so they cover the whole of the uh, the pitch as well as the outfield. Last law that I'm covering this evening is intervals. So what is an example of an interval according to the laws of cricket? And these are scheduled intervals, intervals that gets decided before the game start. So the mother body of cricket decides on these intervals. So firstly, a scheduled interval is the period between close of play on one day and the start of the next day's play. That is an example of a scheduled interval. So in our test mats, they, they one ends at five o'clock Day two starts at 10 o'clock. So between five o'clock on day one and 10 o'clock on day two, that is seen in the law as a scheduled interval. Interval between innings, seen in the law as a scheduled interval. Interval for meals, uh, tea time and lunch time, 
also a scheduled interval. Interval for drinks, also scheduled interval. And lastly, any other agreed interval. These are seen, these five instances are seen in the laws as scheduled uh, intervals. So when it comes to the timings of these intervals, the governing body of uh, cricket for that particular competition, they decide on these uh, timings. Example, in Test Match Cricket, the International Cricket Council, they decide on the timings. When it comes to the length of the lunch interval, in Test Cricket, it's 40 minutes. The length of the T interval in Test Cricket is 20 minutes. The interval between innings is always a 10 minutes. A interval for drinks in Test Cricket is four minutes. So these timings decided by the governing body of cricket for that particular competition. Uh, uh, in, in South Africa, Cricket South Africa is the governing body of, uh, of cricket. In, in the provincial competition in South Africa, they also have the exact same timings as the ICC for, uh, for Test Match Cricket. But again, it can be any length. It, it just depends on what the governing body of cricket uh, for that competition decided. So in the law, the law leave it up to the governing body to decide on the length of these intervals. The law doesn't tell you how long your intervals uh, should be, especially your lunch in your tea. All the law tell us uh, that when you take your interval for lunch or tea, it needs to be taken from the call of time before the interval until the call of play on resumption after the interval. I'll use an example to illustrate how, uh, what the law means. In our test match, which starts at 10 o'clock and we have a two hour session and lunch is at 12 o'clock. So lunch will be from 12 o'clock till 12.40. In test cricket, our lunch is 40 minutes, so from 12 till 12.40. So the law tell us the length of your interval from the time you've called over time and lunch from that time, and let's say it's 12 o'clock, and on the resumption of play after lunch, when that first ball gets bowled, it needs to be exactly 40 uh, minutes. It's not always the case that you end exactly 12 o'clock. Sometimes you do get to 12 o'clock and you only are halfway through uh, the over. You will see in later laws that if you do get halfway through the over at 12 o'clock, you first need to complete the over before you go for lunch. So now you get to 12, you're halfway through the over and you only complete the over at 12.03. So what does law tell us? Law tell us Lunch needs to be that 40-minute duration. So if you called overtime and lunch at 12.03, when do you restart after lunch? At 12.43. Same principle applied to the tea time. I mentioned earlier about the interval between innings, always 10 minutes according to the laws of cricket. So South Africa gets bowled out at 11.10. Uh, India needs to face the first ball at 11.20. Change of innings, 10 minutes. There are instances in the law where they do try to save a bit of time to maximize play uh, during uh, the day. So the, you will cover now instances where certain things happen uh, during the day's play and where we'll do certain things to maximize play. I'll give you an example of those when it comes to the interval between uh, innings. So law tell us, if an interval ends when 10 minutes or less remains before the agreed uh, close of play, it will be the end of day on, for that particular day. I'll use an example to illustrate this point. Our end of day play in our test match is five o'clock. At 16.50, South Africa gets dismissed. So law tell us that when an innings in, 10 minutes or less before the close of play, 
So how close a place five o'clock? South Africa gets dismissed at 16.50. So this is 10 minutes or less before the close of play. Law now tell us that it is now close of play for that day and we need to come back tomorrow morning. So yes, we finished 10 minutes earlier, but law also tell us that even though we finished 10 minutes earlier, in this instance, we will not start 10 minutes earlier the following day. So again, just to, to maximize play, to save time, if an innings in 10 minutes or less before close of play, we it will be stumps on that particular day. Also, again, to save some time, law tell us that if there is a declaration or a team forfeits an innings during an interruption or a scheduled interval of more than 10 minutes, the change of, in change of innings interval will be incorporated into your lunch interval or tea interval or your interruption. Use an example to illustrate this. Our, in our test match, lunch is at 12 o'clock and play will restart at 12.40. At lunchtime, South Africa is 500 for the last of four wickets when lunch gets taken at 12 o'clock. At 10 past 12, captain of South Africa comes to you informing you that I am declaring. So 10 past 12, captain is declaring. So what the law now tell us is, yes, there's now a change of innings interval because the uh, um, India will now come out to bat after lunch. But because this change of inning interval happened during an interval that is of more than 40 minutes duration, the change of innings interval will be incorporated into our lunch interval. There is a but. If, for example, another scenario, South Africa again, 500 for the last of five weeks at lunchtime when you take lunch at 12 o'clock. But this time the captain of South Africa comes to you at 12.35 informing you of the declaration. So we took lunch at 12 o'clock. So the play supposedly had to restart at 12.40, but in this instance, so the, uh, but the captain only informs you at 12.35 of the declaration. Now law tell us that there's only five minutes to go until we're supposed to start. We now need to give the opposing side enough opportunity to firstly for the opening batters to, to, to get paired up for rolling to the to take place if the field the but now batting captain wants rolling so now a 10 minute change of innings will take place so the declaration happened at 12:35 play will restart at 12:45 it's only if the declaration happens when there's more than 10 minutes remaining in your interval or your interruption then you can incorporate it if less than 10 minutes, you need to start 10 minutes later to allow the now batting captain to, to exercise the rolling option if he or she wants it and for the opening bat um, to, get, to get ready to pair up. Also, again, to maximize uh, play, the law is flexible. The law allows you to change your agreed times for your interval. Law, te law tell us that if at any time during the game, if play gets lost due to ground, weather and light, and usually it's a uh, rain and players needs to leave the field. So at any time, captains and the two umpires can decide to change the times for the lunch and the tea interval. Uh, but to have these changes done, both captains and both umpires need to agree. If there's no agreement, lunch needs to stay at the set uh, times. So this is like a catch-all phrase where the, where the law tell us, at any time, you are allowed to change your timings for your lunch and your tea as long as captains and umpires uh, agree. 
There are also specific instances where the law tell us that you will uh, change your time for your lunch interval if the following instances happen. First instance, if an innings ends 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, you will take your lunch immediately. Lunch then needs to be the agreed time. I'll use an example to illustrate this. Our lunch in our test match is 12 o'clock. South Africa gets dismissed at 11.52. What happens next? So we're now eight minutes to go to lunch. Law guide us here by telling us we're now trying to save time. We're trying to maximize time. So what we're going to do? If an innings ends when there's 10 minutes or less to the lunch interval, you will take your lunch interval immediately. So in our example, South Africa dismissed at 11.52, and this is 10 minutes or less uh, to our scheduled lunch interval at 12 o'clock. This is actually eight minutes. So because this is 10 minutes or less to our lunch interval, we will take lunch immediately. So at 11.52, we're taking lunch. When will we come back after lunch? Remember, uh, law tell us lunch needs to be our agreed duration, and, and in test matters, it's 40 minutes. So if our lunch time started at 11.52, we need to come back at 12.32. So at 12.32, the first ball needs to be bowled 40 minutes later. So this is when an innings ends 10 minutes or less. Also, the law tell us again to maximize time. If it rains, or, or let's say there is uh, adverse conditions with ground, weather, or light, and usually rain, so let's use rain as an example. So if it rains 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, you will, all, you will all also take lunch immediately. So let's say lunch is at 12 o'clock, at 11.50 it starts raining. Law tell us, if it rains 10 minutes or less, take lunch immediately. So in our example, because 11.50 is 10 minutes or less before our agreed time for lunch, lunch will be taken immediately. Lunch will then be our agreed time. So if we took lunch at 11.50, when will we restart? We will restart at 12.30, uh, obviously uh, um, weather conditions permitting. If it's still raining at 12.30, obviously we can't restart. But if it stopped during the lunch interval, uh, we will then restart at 12.30 in my example. So those were two instances where you can change your agreed time for your lunch interval. So when innings ends 10 minutes or less, you take lunch immediately. When it rains 10 minutes or less, you take lunch immediately. So uh, what about the tea time? Tea time slightly different, but same principle apply. What is the difference? When it comes to tea time, it is 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea. So if an innings ends 30 minutes or less before tea time, tea time will be taken immediately. And the 10 minute change of innings will be then incorporated into your tea time. I'll use an example to illustrate this point. Let's say our tea time is three o'clock. Our scheduled e tea time is three o'clock. At 14.40, South Africa gets uh, dismissed. Is, so this is 20 minutes to go till T. Now, law tell us, if an innings ends 30 minutes or less, we need to take T immediately, and T will be in our agreed time. So in our example, when the innings, when South Africa was dismissed at 14.40, this is uh, less than 30 minutes to go till your scheduled T interval, so you'll take your T interval immediately. So T will be taken from 14.40, T will be our agreed duration, and the first ball of the T needs to be pulled at 1,500 hours. So, same principle apply as to uh, the lunch interval. Only difference here, lunch is if an innings ends 10 minutes or less. Uh, tea time is if an innings ends 30 minutes or less. Then we'll take tea immediately. Uh, point two tell us, when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for tea, an interval between innings is already in progress, play needs to resume at the end of the 10-minute interval. Uh, example to illustrate point number two, our tea time is at 3 o'clock. At 
14.25, South Africa gets dismissed. So 14.25 is 35 minutes till T. Can you take T immediately? No, you can't, because in point number one tells us you can only take T if, if an innings ends 30 minutes or less before the, before the scheduled T interval. So now this, in, in my example now, is it is now 35 minutes when the innings ends at, now, at 14.25. So now law tell us that we will now have a 10-minute change of innings interval from 14.25 till 14.35. And play will restart at 14.35, and we will then play up until 3 o'clock, which is our scheduled T interval. Point three, tell us that if an inning, if, if it st starts to rain or, or, or due to adverse conditions, whether it's ground, weather or light, and it, let's use rain as an example, if, it's, if it rains 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea, you need to take your tea immediately. So for 1,500 hours is our tea time. At 14.35, it starts to rain. Law now tell us. What do you need to do? Because now this is uh, less than 30 minutes to go before you agree time for tea. You now take your tea immediately. Tea will be from 14.35 till 14.55 when that first ball needs to be bowled, um, conditions permitting. Point four. Again, this uh, covers where changing your agree time for tea. So if a stoppage is already in progress, when 30 minutes remain before the agreed time for T, you can bring T time forward. Example to illustrate this, at our T is 1,500 hours. At 14.20, it starts to rain. What happens next? Because this is not 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for T, and let's say captains cannot agree to bring an earlier T, you now cannot take an early tea because it's now 40 minutes to go till the tea break. Law now tell us is that you cannot take an early tea at 14.20, but when you get to 14.30, now it is 30 minutes to go until tea, you can now take an early tea, and your tea will now be from 14.30 till 14.50, and your first ball needs to be bowled at 14.30 uh, weather conditions. Permitting. Yeah, so those are just instances where we try to maximize play where certain events happen, uh, whether it's prior to lunchtime or prior to tea time, where you do take an early lunch or an early tea. And just the reason for this is and why the law is a bit flexible is just for you to try to maximize a time for you to get more cricket in. That's why the law is uh, flexible and allow you to change your timings for lunch and for tea. Another instance of flexibility of the law is when it comes to your lunch or your tea interval, when a side is nine wickets down. And again, the principle here is to maximize play. So when the side is nine uh, wickets down, the law now tell us uh, that if a side is already nine wickets down, or the ninth wicket falls uh, up until the final ball, ball for T, you will not take the lunch or the T interval immediately. You will delay the, the lunch and the T interval up to a max of 30 uh, minutes. You, you're giving the fielding side the opportunity to try to take the 10th uh, wicket. So if they take the 10th wicket, you can then have your lunch in your T interval and your change of innings will now in be incorporated into your lunch or your T interval. I'll give you an example to illustrate this. Our lunch in our test match is at 12 o'clock. When we get when we get to um, twelve o'clock, South Africa is five hundred for for nine. What does law tell us now? It's now twelve o'clock. Are you going to take lunch? No, law tell us we're not going to take lunch, and the reason for this is because South Africa is nine wickets down. We will now extend play for a max of thirty minutes to see whether the fielding side can take the 10th wicket. 
but it's only up for a max of 30 minutes. So our lunch is at 12 o'clock. We'll give the fielding side half an hour max to see if they can take the, the 10 to wicket. If we get to 12.30 and now at the end of the over and they haven't taken the 10 to wicket, it will now be lunch at 12.30. Our lunch will be 40 minutes duration from 12.30 till 13.10. But let's say we get to 12 o'clock. So Africa's now on wickets down. We now just heard that we don't take uh, lunch time because the side is nine weeks down. We need to extend up until a max of 30 minutes. But now in this new example, let's say so, um, at 12.10, the fielding side takes the 10th wicket. What happens now? So at 12.10, we will now take lunch time. So lunch time will now be our agreed duration from 12.10 up until 12.50. And our change of innings interval will be incorporated into our lunch time. So just to summarize this, it's uh, the same principle applied to T. So whether it's lunch or the T interval, if a side is nine wickets down and they must be nine wickets down, you'll delay your lunch time or your tea time max 30 minutes. Interval for drinks. The Lord has guided us here by telling us drinks shall not exceed five minutes. Uh, so in test match cricket, the drinks are, are four minutes. Uh, that's a playing condition for test match cricket. Uh, in provincial cricket in South Africa, it's, it's also four minutes. All the Lord does is, is just guiding us by telling us that you, you can determine or the governing body can determine how long they want drinks to be. But that drinks interval shall not exceed five minutes. Uh, also, the law tell us, and again, this is a, a time-saving um, thing to maximize play by telling us that if a wicket falls or a battery tires within five minutes of the agreed times for drinks, the drinks interval to be taken immediately. Give an example to illustrate this. In our test match, um, they have two-hour sessions. So, so from on day one, our test match starts at 10 o'clock. Lunchtime is at, two, at 12 o'clock. So in the middle of the session, there will be a drinks break of four minutes. So at 11 o'clock, there will be a drinks break from 11 o'clock till 11.04. Now, Lord tell us that if a wicket falls within five minutes of the agreed time, so within five minutes of our 11 o'clock in our test match, drinks are then be taken immediately. So our drinks is 11 o'clock. At 10.57, a wicket falls. What do you do? You will take drinks immediately. Drinks will then be for four minutes. In test match cricket, drinks is it's, uh, it's four minutes. So drinks will be from 10.57 until uh, 11.01. But a wicket must fall or a batter must retire within five minutes of the agreed time. If it's more than five minutes, you will take drinks at the scheduled time. Like if a wicket should fall at 10.54 and our drinks is at 11 o'clock, you cannot take uh, drinks immediately. This is now six minutes to go to drinks. You, um, you At 10.54 when the wicket fell, you, the, the new batter will have to come in and you will take drinks at the scheduled time of, of 11 o'clock. Law also guide us, um, and we will get to the concept of the last hour in later laws, but when we enter our last hour, an interval for drinks cannot be taken during the last hour. Score, scorers always to be informed if there are any changes to our timings when it comes to uh, intervals. So if you are taking an early lunch and, and let's say South Africa gets bowled out at 11.50 and as you walk off the field, you pop in at the scorers and we've last week uh, um, on Tuesday we, uh, we said – before you go, enjoy your lunch or your tea. Just pop in at the scorers. Just ask them um, their books. Does it uh, correspond? If it corresponds, then you're happy. 
And if you came a bit uh, um, off earlier because of the innings change at 11.50, just inform the scorers. scorers. We uh, Innings change at 11.50 because it's 10 minutes uh, or less to go to lunch. We took an early lunch, so lunch will now be from 11.50 till 12.30. Uh, Always keep the scorers informed of any of the changes that you do uh, make to your hours of play. Tom, I'm handing back over to you. I've covered my laws for this evening. I thank you so much. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Abdullah. And I hope the listeners enjoyed that session. Uh, a bit uh, theory heavy today, but uh, it is important to get through all of these laws because even if they are not all tested in our level one exam, uh, we need to be ready for anything that might come about in a game of cricket and that we will do so by going through all 42 laws. Um, the presentation is being requested by Rashid. Rashid, I see you're in hospital. Hope you get better soon. I will post the link into the chat box uh, later on. Please note that the presentation is for the entire six lectures from law one to 42. We will only present law one to 40 because law 41 and law 42 are not examined in the Cricket South Africa level one exam. But it is one presentation for all six lectures. The seventh lecture, we are merely going to go through all the slides that have Lyme text. So that is a revision lecture and no new material will be presented in that lecture. I did see Langton in the meeting room earlier. Going through the list of candidates still in the meeting room, I, I do not see Langton at the moment. He, he probably has had connection issues. Uh, I actually see him back. Uh, so Langton, uh, I'm going to start the question and answer session by throwing a question at you. Uh, we spoke last week, in fact, we spoke on Tuesday about the dangerous and unreasonable conditions that we cannot play in. And today, Abdullah showed us a video of rain at Trent Bridge where they have a hovercraft for, for covers. Uh, we certainly don't have uh, those facilities uh, in Africa, as far as I know. Um, but we do have the challenges of rain quite often in our matches. So Langton, my question to you is when it stops raining in any match, whether it's a uh, four day match or a uh, limited overs 50 over match or a T20 match, what is it that you as an umpire is looking for to declare the field fit for play? So are we worried about the bowler's run-ups? Are we worried about any wet patches on the pitch? Uh, are there any guidelines you can give our umpires as to how after a rain break we can judge a field to be fit for play again before allowing the players back onto the field? Hi, I'm Hi Abdullah, and good evening, everyone who's joined the call. Well, morning to those of you that are in the States and uh, the Caribbean islands. And good evening to the rest of us that are in Africa. Sorry, I had connection issues and I'm back on the call now. And to answer your question, Tom. So for me personally, um, what I what I start by doing is gauge the mood in the camps to see if both teams want to play or not, if they feel like it's safe or not, that's an indicator for me to see if it's worth exploring playing. The next thing is what we advise to do by the ICC is we start by looking at the pitch itself going out outward. So if the pitch is good for play, we then go, how's the 30-yard circle? 
if the 30 yard circle is good, then we then go outside the 30 yard circle close to the boundary. What are the areas of concern? So once the pitch is good, we we start worrying about going out outward, if that makes any sense. So if the pitch is great for play, awesome. If the outfield, if the square is good, then we don't spend too much time on problem areas outside the 30 yard circle. Yes, they are concerned, but we are not as fast or as worried about delaying start if there are one or two areas outside the 30 yard circle. And the reverse is true if the pitch or the 30 yard circle aren't as great, then we look to delay start. I don't know if that helps anyone. And again, so as a guideline, if one umpire thinks it's dangerous, we probably want to hold off for a little bit because safety is of paramount importance. And if you're going to umpire at a venue where there's a, a groundsman or curator, speak to that person because they, they, they're in the know more than anything. Those relationships that were spoken about in lecture one on Tuesday help us a bit because we're managing events. We are not there to be hard on anyone or to be officious. Once we sort of create relations with the ground staff and players, it helps us gauge where the game is going to go. If one team looks like the one to play and the other team doesn't look like the one to play, sure, it rests solely on the umpires. If both teams look like the one to play and we feel mm, it's not quite as good, we play. If both teams say, no, this is not good and we think it's good, that means there's a problem with the decision that we're making as umpires. Awesome, Langton. Thanks for that uh, very thorough answer. Uh, ground weather and light is a, I think, one of the more difficult uh, topics for especially new umpires to uh, handle. Um, so I hope that they have learned something from your answer. I'm sure that they have. So let's go into the meeting room. And I see that Mohammed has had his hand up since halfway through Abdullah's presentation. So, Mohammed, uh, please uh, unmute your microphone and you can address your question. Yes, uh, good evening all. I don't know what the time frame in South Africa, but um, I would like to say um, uh, with God blessing and um, congratulations to all of my fellow colleagues to attend this meeting. Sorry, this class and it is very informative. There's a lot of uh, thing for us to learn. We learn every day. Um, you know, umpiring is like uh, like an attorney general work. You know, like a lawyer. You know, every day we learn something. However, I make it very simple, Mr. Tom. I put my hand up for the past half an hour because um, I don't know if it's connect connection issue or you change the link. However, my question is very simple. I'm not going to elaborate. I have my other colleagues would like to say something as well. Um, if possible, I do appreciate if you could send me, like I said, a loss out. I click on something and unfortunately I get a joint. I don't know what if, what I click on, but I play wrong with it. However, I would like to uh, have the question from law five to law, law nine. That's what I missed, missed out. And I'd like to say thank you if you could please forward it to me. I'll study it um, because I lost like half an hour. I tune on like 1146 New York time and I don't know what happened. So I don't know if in the future in this, you know, class, if sorry to see if you guys are going to change the link or knowing to me or whatever. But I've, like I said, I click on something and I join Mr. Tom. Uh, so I, I lost from law five to law nine. I appreciate if you could send me those questions. I review it. I can send it to me personally. And um, I have to talk to you personally, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. That's You're welcome, all. Muhammad. Um, we have a different meeting link for each lecture. I do. I did not get it. I did okay. not get it. I have the old one. I okay. So, um, Mohammed, if you can uh, put your email in the chat box, or if you are worried about um, 
sensitivity or confidentiality of your email address, you can email training at wpcua.co.za and I will make sure that you get the link for next week Tuesday's lecture well in advance. I did send out the meeting invite uh, about 12 hours ago uh, before I went to work this morning. Uh, so everybody who is on my mailing list should have got that invite. Uh, so apologies for you not getting it. Uh, possibly I don't have you on the mailing list. And so if you advise your um, email address, I will be able to no, add you I to did, the mailing list. Excuse me, I yes, did sir. email you or someone who sent me to remind me that today is the meeting and I click yes. So you have my email address. That's all I have. I did not get the new link. I click yes today, you know, at the meeting commence at 12 o'clock at 11.45 I tune in. I don't know if it's connection issue. I did not get no new link. That's my question to you. I reply you, I text you all the time. That same link. I don't know if it's a, it's a technical issue or a connection Sports issue. Team. I don't know. What would you like me to do? Uh, please put your email address in the chat box and I will make sure that you get your link and we can check it together that it works uh, as soon as you get that link. You don't have to wait until the meeting time to uh, go into the meeting room. Well, actually, I call you on WhatsApp anyway, so you know you did not respond. Uh, yeah, Mohammed, uh, you must understand I've got a full-time job outside of cricket, um, so I'm not able to always take okay, uh, okay. cricket calls. Okay, thank you. During office thank you. Hours. I, I, I'll send okay. you my email. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Janine, you've got your hand up. Uh, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Hi, guys. I hope you all are well. Um, so, um, very interesting. I think it's a few questions, um, but it has to do um it has it's regarding the bales and the stumps and then the crease lines um so obviously we start without the luxury of having a third umpire um when you start umpiring so <clears throat> i'm from cape town so like you guys know we've got windy situations sometimes and stuff like that so when you take the bales off and you need to umpire where it's a uh, uh a throw to the keeper or to the bowler, how do you determine um, when the batter is out if you have no bales? Because according to what I understand, if the bales leave the stumps, you're out. Um, so do you see when the, the keeper or the bowler's hands touches the, the, the stumps or when they break the stumps? Um, and then also uh, going with that, um, you need to look at that and you need to look at the bat. And I, I guess the bat needs to go over the whole crease line to determine if it's out or not. Um, and then also, small question regarding that is, what is the thickness of the crease lines, more or less, that gets painted? I don't know if it makes sense what I'm asking, um, but I do know that sometimes you have only that split second to make that decisions, especially when you don't have bales on 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 your stumps or on the wickets. Sure, Janine, um, some very good questions there. Uh, I'm going to answer your second question about the thickness of the lines. And then I'm going to ask Abdullah to talk us through uh, judging of, uh, let's say, runouts when bales are off. So if you look at the picture of the stumps and the creases at <laughs> JB Marks Oval in Poch of Strum, uh, mm -hmm. I would say that the thickness of those uh, lines are about two and a half to three centimeters. Okay. Um, but if you look at the uh, the way that we judge the start of a line, 
-hmm. it is the edge that is closest to the stumps. Okay. Yeah. So the pop increase, the line that matters is the inside edge of the pop increase. Is the what, sorry, the what edge? Someone is rooting there in the background. <laughs> the inside edge of the pop increase, the edge okay. that is closest to the stumps. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if a batter's bat is on the line, they mm -hmm. are out if the stumps are broken while the bat is on the line. So okay. the bat, if it's on the outside edge of the pop increase or if it's, if it's on the middle of that line, they are not considered grounded behind the pop increase. Only, okay. only once the bat is past the back edge of that pop increase is the batter considered to be in his or her ground. So the thickness of the line actually does not matter. You get grounds where the line is about four centimeters thick. You get lines where the line is half a centimeter thick. It mm. does, what matters is the edge of the line that is closest to the stump. That okay. is what you as an umpire and um, a television umpire would look at in slow motion for a review uh, for a stumping or a run out. I hope okay. that answers that question. Yes, yes. I, th I just thought, you know, there is like a certain standard because, I mean, if I'm playing with one centimetre, the other team's playing with four centimetre in another game, I mean, I think it makes a difference, especially for front foot checking for bowling and the running between the wickets. So I just thought that was maybe, you know, something to look at. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the edge of the line that matters is the edge that is the closest to the stumps. To the stumps, okay. The, the thickness of the line is actually irrelevant. Um, okay. If, if you think that what matters is the edge that is closest to the stumps. Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, great. Now, Abdullah, you've got an awesome uh, two and a half minute video explaining how to judge dismissals when there is no bales on the stumps. Uh, can you summarize that for Janine, please? And in the meantime, I will look for that video and put the link in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, Janine, thank you for your question. Uh, so Janine, let me start off by saying there is a difference between when you uh, don't play with any bells, and let's say in your example, windy conditions, you remove the bells due to windy uh, conditions, and you don't mm -hmm. play with any bells, and when you do remove the bells, you need to remove it from both ends, because many times bells will just fall will continuously fall off from one end for for some strange reasons, but it happens quite often. But the law tells us when you do remove, uh, decide to remove the bells due to windy conditions, you need to remove it from both ends. So yes. now, when you do decide to remove the bells from one uh, from both ends, the law completely changes when it comes to putting the wicket down. So again, okay. I'm emphasize this law is only applicable when you re decide to remove the bells from both ends after the uh, um, remove bells due to windy conditions. And this is how mm -hmm. the law works. All that now needs to happen is that the ball just needs to touch any of the stumps that's in the ground for the wicket to be put down. This is how the law works when you remove the bells. Now, it makes it so difficult because all you now need to judge is it just needs to touch, whether it's a feather of a touch, a small touch. All the ball needs to do is touch any of the stumps, and if there's no part of the batter's foot or uh, person or bat grounded behind the popping crease, when the ball touches any of the stumps, and then that batter bat is eligible to be given out, run out. 
So just to confirm again, as soon as you decide to remove the belts due mm -hmm. to windy conditions and you do remove it by both sides, all that you need to judge is, did the ball touch the stumps? Yes or no. And a touch is, doesn't have to be full on. Uh, it can just be a small touch, but you need to make that call. And it is a difficult call, especially if there is, uh, if it's a small touch. I've been in situations where we remove the bells, you know, in Cape Town, there's lots of windy days, and this was actually happened in Fisuk, which is, I think, the windiest uh, um, part of, of Cape Town. And, mm. um, and the ball just touched the, or, or so the fielding side claimed, but I, from where I was standing, I didn't see the small touch. The feeling side say, yeah, but they, it, it just kissed the stumps. I wasn't sure. I gave the batter not out because I wasn't sure. It, it does make it difficult, but all the law tells us is it just needs to touch the stumps for the batter to be given out, run out, if there's no part of the bat behind the popping crease. Similarly, for even for bold, if you do remove the belts due to windy conditions and you remove it both sides, for the batter to be given out bold, the ball just needs to touch, to kiss the stumps for the batter to be given out bold. That is how the law works. When you do decide to dispense the bells due to, due to uh, windy uh, conditions. Uh, I also just want to bring under your attention uh, what I've just covered is, and when I, uh, when I said the ball just needs to touch the stumps, this is when you do decide to remove the bells due to windy conditions. This, is, this law only comes into effect once that decision gets made to remove the bells due to windy uh, conditions. If, if the, the bells falls off for whatever reason um, while the ball is still in play, uh, let's have example, the bowler bowls the ball, the bowl, oh, before the, the ball was bowled, the bowls was on the stumps. Now the bowler runs in, the bowler bowls the ball, the batter eats it uh, into the covers, now the wind blows off the bells. In this instance, because you didn't remove the bells due to windy conditions, this is now the bells was on. The, the the wind blew the, off the bells while the ball was still in progress. Now, how do you put the wicket down? Now you need to either, uh, with the ball and the stump, take a stump out the ground, or one of the fielders need to throw a stump totally out the ground, or you need to hit the stump totally out the ground. Why I'm mentioning this is, I'm just showing you the difference be when when you decide to remove the bells due to windy conditions, then a certain uh, laws kick in where it just needs to touch. But when you when the bells were on when the ball was was delivered, and let's say the wind uh, blew blew it off, uh, then to put the wicket down, you need to either take out the stump with the ball, throw the stump out of the ground, or hit the stump out of the ground. Okay, Did I answer so your question, Denin? Yeah, so when, when it blows off and it's in play, then you physically, the stump needs to be out of the ground. You can't just throw the ball and the stumps just go. Open. No, it, no, no, it, needs, it to be needs to be uprooted. Okay, yes. okay and then um, what I wanted to ask you with this um, small touch and stuff that you were talking about, let's say we're throwing to the keeper's end or the bowler end and they, they take the ball to do the run out. The hand also just needs to touch just the... Needs to, as long as the hand and the uh, the ball is in, in the hand, it just needs to touch. That's all for you to to consider giving uh, the better out, run out. Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. Then I am done. Thank you. That answered okay. my questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Over, over, Tom. You're welcome, Janine. Glad you learned something today. I have posted Abdullah's um, awesome video about umpiring with bells off in the chat box. You can have a look at that for more details. And I've also posted the meeting invite for next week, Tuesday, in the chat box. Um, so maybe some of you are not receiving my emails. I do have all of you that have put your email addresses in the chat box. I have put them 
put you on my mailing list. Some of you are already on my mailing list. Some of you are not, but you will all receive the link by email on next week, Tuesday morning, 12 hours before the lecture. So 6 a.m. South African time. Right. Um, Mohammed, you've got your hand up again. Do you have another question? Yes, just for confirmation, do you have my email address? I send it to everyone in the chat box. Yes, I got it from the chat box and I put it in my uh, mailing list. And okay, thank you. Okay, you will thank all you. receive the invite thank you. next week, Tuesday. Uh, question number two. Question number two. Is it possible? Can you send me the question from law five to law nine? What I lost? Um, because I I I joined in like twelve like twenty five minutes after class commencing. Okay. okay. I appreciate um, it. I will post in the chat box the link to download the presentation. I'm not yeah. sure what questions you are referring to for laws five to nine. What Mr. Abdullah thought from law five to law nine, I, I would like to have the question. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to try work on the answer. Don't worry about it. Okay. So this it. meeting. Send it to me. This meeting is being recorded, Mohammed, and two hours after the end of the lecture, it will be posted on YouTube, and you can go and watch the video on YouTube to go through the lecture in total. And then you can also download the presentation that I will post the link of in the chat box shortly. And there you will be able to go through each slide that is presented in the six lectures of this course. I hope that helps, Mohammed. Okay, I try. I try my best. Thank you. God bless. You're welcome. Diraviam, you've got your hand up. You can unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, Dom. My name is actually Sendil. Theraviam is my father's name. So okay. you can call me as Sendil. And I have doubt is like what the Janine is asked earlier. So that question, my question is like, if the bias is removed in the first innings, maybe if it is a T20 matches, due to wind, you are removing the bias. So the second innings, the wind is not that much. Whether you will keep the bias on, if you keep the bails on, the team first batting, even though ball kisses, like Abdullah said, if touches, we will never know, we will not give an out out. So it is some favor of the batsman who played for the first innings. Whether we will play the both the innings without bails or we will add bails at the middle, that is first question. The second question is, the picture what you showed is, the 22 yards is, the stem to stem with the middle or the back of the stem to back of the stems in the grease. As per the picture, what you showed, it is marking in the center of the stems. I think probably it is back of the stems to back of the stem. 22 yards is. Uh, Central, I will answer your second question first, and then I will ask Abdullah to answer your question about the bells. Lots of questions about playing without bells today, Dula. Uh, so Sentil, I'm once again going to share that presentation and I will talk you through the measurements. And you can see here that the, is my screen being shared, Abdullah? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, okay. Not yet, Tom. Okay, hold on, I'm going to. Share it quickly. Okay. Yeah, now it's here, Tom. Okay, great. You will see in this diagram, Central, that the stumps actually cut the back edge of the bowling crease um, in half, or the back edge of the bowling crease cuts the stumps in half. So that's actually where you measure from. Uh, remember I told you that if you look at these arrows, they always point to the back edge or the edge of the line that's closest to the stumps. And the edge of the line 
of the bowling crease that's closest to the stumps is the back edge of the bowling crease. So to answer your question, the 22 yards is measured from the back edge of the bowling crease to the back edge of the other bowling crease. Uh, and it should be in the middle of the middle stump that you are measuring from. I think okay. probably this is back, back edge of the stump, I think. I heard that it is the back edge of the, the stumps. It's not the back edge of the stumps, Sento. You can see that the stumps are cut in half by the back edge of the bowling crease. So it is actually the middle of the stump to the middle of the stump should be 20.12 meters or 22 yards. I hope that answers your first, your second question. On to your first question, uh, Abdullah. Sentil wants to know, is it fair or unfair that we would have bales on in the first innings and then the wind dies down during the lunch break and then in the second innings we have bales back on. So we had bales off in the morning and we had bales on in the uh, afternoon. Uh, Sentil reckons that's unfair. Uh, what does the law say? Uh, Sentil, uh, the law guides us here by telling us that if there's a reason to dispense with the belt, and 99.99% of the time it is due to win while we dispensing the belts, and we have just saw that there's a completely new set of rules that comes into play when we do decide to dispense uh, with the bales. And it is so much more difficult uh, to, to judge uh, whether it's a run out, or whether it's bold, if the ball just kiss the, uh, the stumps. But these are the rules that they set in place when you do decide to dispense uh, with the bales. So obviously you would prefer the bales to be on the stumps because it's so much easier for the umpires uh, to make the judgment call when the wicket is put down. But the law also guide us by telling us, by saying, yes, now there is a reason why you uh, are dispensing with the belts due to, our, due to uh, strong winds. But as soon as conditions permit, you need to put the belts uh, back on. That's how... Uh, um, we want to play cricket with the belts on the stumps. It, uh, it just makes it easy, easier for, for everyone. But the law uh, uh, do make uh, leeway in case you need to play with, uh, without um, belts. So law tell us, if conditions permit, please put the belts uh, back on. So now in your example, as conditions now, yes, uh, it was windy in the first innings. And um, but the wind then died down in in the in the second uh, innings. But law tell us if as soon as conditions uh, um, permitted and you can put the bells back on, we need to put the bells back on and play with uh, the bells. Uh, over, Tom. Second innings bad. Second innings captain is again came to us as umpire and he is requesting to. As to without bail, we can play because the team do the first batting they do without bails, and they have a more advantages when compared to us. Like that, if he is argues or if he asks, what we need to clarify? Yeah, it's, we just yeah, it's say not as per the law. Yeah, as per, the law, easy, as per it, the law, we need to follow. Yes, it's not easy. Uh, easy this season, you can see the law sentence um, in the slide that's currently on the screen. It tells us the law tells us. As soon as conditions permit, you need to put the bales uh, back on uh, the stumps. It's not for the captain to decide or to argue. That's what the law tells us, put the bales back, uh, back on. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Okay, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Abdullah.
Next hand up is Yako. Yako, please unmute your microphone and address your question. Uh, good evening, Tom and Abdullah. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, it's just another question with regards to the bales being blown off whilst the ball is in play. The, uh, the bowler is running in. The wind blows down one of the bales. The batter steps back and he hits the wicket of the bale that has been removed. Please give me an answer on that. Thank you. Sorry, Yaku. Um, the 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 wind blew off one or both bales. Um, either either or one or two. But okay. the batter then plays plays onto his wicket, um, and specifically the one where the bale has been removed by the wind. OK, so we're going to deal with that in detail in a, another law. The wicket is down and also the dead ball law. But uh, Abdullah can give us a answer to your scenario as to what us as umpires should do as soon as the bales are blown off at the striker's end uh, while the ball is live. Abdullah? Uh, Yaku? <laughs> We'll, we're going to get to this law in detail. Um, it's law 20, and law guides us that while, as soon as the ball becomes live and before the batter has opportunity to play it, the bells, let's say, gets blown off. Umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. If bells falls off at the striker's wicket, umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So as soon as those bells fall off, Yaku, the strikers in umpire, you see in a better position. There's nothing stopping the bowlers in umpire calling it, but, uh, but the strikers in umpire is in a better position. As soon as those bells, whether it's one or two bells, if it falls off, the strikers in umpire or either umpire immediately to call and signal dead ball. That ball will have then have to be rebuilt. As soon as those bells falls off, Yaku. And anything that Thank you very much, guys. after dead ball has been called is irrelevant. So the striker will not be out hit wicket. Understood. Thanks very much. Cool. Janine, you've got your hand up again. Are we still on bails? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It seems like I started something here. <laughs> Maybe the guys must come bail us out here with the taxi violence this side. <laughs> um, uh, we were we were speaking about intervals. Um, I just want to know if we are later on gonna speak about intervals when there is a injury uh, taking place. Um, or uh, I know obviously there is a time limit on overs that needs to be bowled, but we have spoken about intervals when it's tea time, lunch time, and stuff like that. Are we uh, going to um, speak about intervals when there is an injury, how much time um, can be taken, when and when it's going to be decided when the batter needs to leave um, the grounds or not? Yeah, so there is... I think law 24, uh, which is uh, substitutes and also penalty time that a fielder has to serve when they're off the field for an internal injury. Uh, when they come back onto the field, they cannot bowl immediately. They have to wait and be on the field for the same amount of time that they were off the field before they can bowl again. Um, in terms of how long a batter is allowed or a fielder is allowed treatment on the field, uh, Abdullah, there are some uh, ICC regulations to that. It is four minutes worth of treatment allowed to a player uh, before that player needs to continue or is taken off the field. I hope that answers your question about the timing. Janine? Oh, yeah, that's that's cool. If we're going to cover the other thing, then that's fine. And then I have my yeah, uh, answer about the interval for the injured. Thank you. Cool. You're welcome. Uh, Mohammed, you're going for your hat trick today for the third time? 
Yeah. <laughs> Unmute your microphone. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mr. Abdullah, um, uh, the question is on Bills uh, once again. Uh, this, the father played the ball. The wind was so he heavy after he, the batter played the ball. The, the, the strikers and Bill dislodge. However, at that point, the fielder then returned the ball, dislodged the Bills for the non striker. The non striker didn't make good of he or she, his or her wrong, it was out of the pop increase. Um, is that be considered as a run out or a dead ball? Because the ball still in play. Good question, Mohammed. Did you understand that, Abdullah? Um, okay, let me go slowly. Uh, Tom, can you just summarize what you asked, please? Uh, yeah, let me go for. Let me okay, give you my ahead. understanding, you. Mohammed. And if uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, so the the batter had an opportunity to play the ball and did play the ball. Uh, after the batter played the ball, the striker played the ball, then the striker's bails fell off due to wind, not because of hit wicket. And then the fielder fielded the ball and realized that the non-striker was out of his or her ground, threw the stumps down and the non-striker was short of his or her ground or was outside his or her ground. Um, is that a run out? Yes or no? Or is the ball dead as soon as the striker's spells were, were blown off the top of the stumps of the striker, but after the striker played the ball? So, so Mohammed, a dead ball law, uh, under the dead ball law, it tells us that if the bails at the striker's end falls off before the striker had opportunity to play at the ball, either umpire to call and signal dead ball at the striker's end. Uh, striker's end umpire is in a better position, but nothing stopping the bowlers in umpire. So before the striker had opportunity to play at the ball, and the bells fall off, or one bell falls off at the striker's end, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. In your scenario, uh, striker played at the ball, wind then blew off the bells at the striker's end. Now the striker had an opportunity to play at the ball, so now the dead ball will not kick in. It kicks in, if, uh, it kicks in uh, if it falls off before the striker had the opportunity to play, to play at the ball. So now the dead ball will not kick in. So now the striker is in, bells lying on the ground, Fielder now picks up the ball and throw and throws at the bowlers in with the bells where the bells are still on, and throws throws down the wicket with the with the non-striker uh, or whoever ran to that in sort of his or her ground. Uh, that would be deemed with the bells on and the bells are off when the wicket is put down and the stri and and the batter sort of his or her ground. That would be deemed a run out. Um, Muhammad. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Janine, your hand is up. Is that a new hand or was that from your previous question? No, no, no. This is a new one. Um, another question on the intervals. I know we covered like when in the 10 minutes um, when you uh, need to call lunch or tea or whatever. Um, we did speak about the clearing. Um, so I want to know, let's say we are in the middle of an over and let's say South Africa is 500 for eight and Glenn McGrath comes and he bowls his third ball and takes a wicket and South Africa decides to declare. How does it work then? Do we just change over and have a certain time for change over? Do we stop in the middle of that over, or how does that work? Or, or will we cover that in another session? Uh, we can answer it now because it does concern intervals. What time is that declaration made? If our lunch is at 12 o'clock, uh, when was, what time was that declaration made? Uh, because that will determine what happens next. Janine? 
Um, I don't know whichever uh, scenario is 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 the easiest to to give so that uh, I can understand or that we can understand. I don't know which would be the 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 best scenario. I don't know if I, Abdullah, because uh, uh, apparently tonight is very good with times, um, so maybe he can give us a a time, you know, for the intervals, you know, um, for changing over or we decide in the middle of an over to to declare, um, yeah. Okay, so Abdullah, let me give you two times to work with. Let us say the declaration happens at 11.45. That's the one scenario. The second scenario is if the declaration happens at 11.55. Please tell us what we do when. Copy, Tom. Uh, Janine, first uh, example, our lunchtime being 12 o'clock in our game, declaration happening at 11.45. So what does law tell us? If an innings ends with 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, we'll take lunch immediately. Mm -hmm. Is this 10 minutes or less before lunch? No, it's not. It's 15 no. minutes to go to lunch. So now we cannot take an early lunch. So what will now happen? There will now be a 10-minute change of innings from 11.45 till 11.55, side B will now have to come out to bat for five minutes from 11.55 until 12 o'clock. So if it even if it happened mid-over, let's say South Africa declared at 11.45 and the, over, uh, the overs was 63.2, 63 overs and two balls when the declaration or the side was... Uh, was the, uh, dismissed. So the side B, let's say India, will come back 10 minutes later at 11.55. And India will now start a fresh. That over uh, 63.2 will now be rounded up to the next whole number. It will now be 60, 64 overs. There will be a 10-minute change of innings. Um, there's another playing condition that tells us that you need to take off two overs for the player change of, of innings. So, so, so now India will come out to bat at 11.55 and they will start a fresh with their first over and first ball will be built. That covers the one scenario when the, there's an innings change at 11.45. When there's mm -hmm. an innings change at 11.55, whether it's a declaration or side being dismissed, the the um, now is it 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch? Yes, it is. It's five minutes to lunch. So now, Lord, mm -hmm. tell us, because this is less than 10 minutes to go to the agreed time for lunch, we will take lunch immediately. Lunch will be from 11.55 until 12.35, so 40 minutes lunch. The change of innings interval will be incorporated into the lunch interval. Did I answer your question, Janine? Yes, yes. I just wanted to know that. Thank you. Mm. No, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm giving you some thinking work tonight. <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, I can I can talk about this all night. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Janine. Next hand up is Heinrich Leroux. Heinrich, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, evening, guys. Um, so my question is also regarding intervals, um, and I think it's law 1.7, the lunch of the T interval at the fall of the ninth wicket. So let's say a wicket falls within that three-minute window. Do you have to take the three-minute extension, or is it up to the fielding captain to decide whether they want to um, use that 30-minute uh, window? Abdullah, is it optional, or does play automatically get extended by 30 minutes? <laughs> Uh, Heinrich, not optional. Law tell us if a side is nine wickets down, leading up till uh, the lunch or tea interval, you must extend play by a maximum of nine of, of 30 minutes. It's not optional. You have to exercise that option and play an extra half an hour maximum unless you take the wicket uh, um, b before the uh, expiry of the 30 minutes. But yes, must extend play by 30 minutes, either lunch or tea. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. 
there are no further hands up. I'm just going through the chat box to see all the questions that were uh, typed out today. Uh, Rashid asked for today's presentation and I have put a link in the chat box, a WeTransfer link. It is the last message currently in the chat box. Click on that and you will download the entire presentation that we are going to use in the first six lectures. From law one to 42, we're only going to present law one to 40, but the entire presentation of law one to 42 is in that link. Uh, Mohammed, going yeah, for I'm your offer. I'm not seeing the link, which link? Was it training at wpcua.co.za? That's the only one, Abdullah, that's the link. Mohammed, I see no link in the chat box. I'm not seeing no link in the chat box. Mohammed, can you scroll down to the bottom of the chat box? Uh, yeah, I'm scrolling down. The only one I saw is my email address I forward to, I mean, to everybody. That's it. I didn't see nothing else. Uh, hold on. I see Mr. Abdullah uh, Sintakamp uh, training at wpcua.co.za. That's the only one. That was posted on 128, sorry, 128 p.m. The New York time mines is 129 p.m. Uh, in New York now. Uh, sorry, it's 206 p.m. in New York now. That's the only one in the chat box. I, I don't know, forget loss. It's not, that's it. I'm not seeing nothing else. Uh, Bahamut, I think you need to somehow scroll further down. There are 10 more messages at least in the chat box after, up, after. Uh, Abdullah posted uh, a training Abdullah at posted. WPCUA. I'm, I'm looking at one, two, just for three, the record. I, four I, more, I am four more to... email. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Four more email, then mine. That's it. I can't scroll no, no, no more. I'm just, saying, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, just for the record, I, I am able to see that message from you, Tom. Yeah, thank uh, you. So, Mohammed, I'm okay. afraid you're having technical duty uh, difficulties. Um, yeah, please try scroll down. If you can't, I will email you the link to download the presentation immediately okay, yeah, after you. this meeting. OK, thank you. That, that would be helpful. Thank you. Have a nice day, everybody. God bless. Enjoy. Right, let's. Uh, let's keep scrolling through the chat box, uh, which for some is uh, not possible, but for us it is um, so. I'm seeing a lot of email addresses. I'm going to add those to the mailing list and make sure that you all receive the link to the next um, lecture on Tuesday morning, South African time. And then I am seeing a thanks from uh, Mohammed Juma in Peter Maritzburg. Nice to hear from you, Juma. Welcome to our class once again. Tembeka is also thanking us for the educational lesson. We'll see you on Tuesday. And I am seeing the link that I posted of the WeTransfer document where you can download the presentation. So there are no further questions in the chat box. There are no hands in the air. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, everybody for their participation. Another interactive lecture, which is how we learn. Thank you for the questions. We are always happy to take them. Abdullah can stay all night to take questions on bails or any other laws uh, that you can think of. Uh, we will reconvene next week, Tuesday, same time, same place, different link. Please look out for my email with the link for uh, next week, Tuesday's meeting. Uh, for those of you who are able to see, it is also in the chat box. Uh, I posted it at around 19.34 South African time this evening. Have a great week further and 
a weekend when it arrives. I will post the recording of this meeting in about an hour and a half time. Keep well, chat soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone.